I am, of course, completely delighted to be made part of this magnificent West Asian undertaking because I do know something about the Abu Dhabi Book Fair, how long it's been around, what its projects are. I'm delighted. Undertaking to reimagine cultural heritage and at the same time to expand the horizon of that heritage by establishing connections with organizations such as the Frankfurt Book Fair. It happened in a peculiar way. My colleague, Mohsin Yassim Al Musawi, told me that Hamid Dabashi, my other colleague, had said that I was very sick. I responded angrily, denying this rumor. Soon, Karin Agjania the, uh, the, uh, from the Strategic Planning Office sent an invitation. And then Dr. Berlant Kabil from marketing took me in hand and made everything possible. Thank you all. <laughs> Alexander Cruz, a colleague and friend from the Philippines, once told me that after he had been teaching my work for some time, an undergraduate student in his class struck his own thigh. Cruz actually repeated the gesture for me and had said, I hate Spivak. <laughs> because I'm so critical, see? I had loved the story. I had got under the skin of an ambitious, smart, young Asian man who was ready to build a career on his country's back. He would become a dollar income private sector guy, right? And he hated me. So I thought, whereas I, like all responsible human science intellectuals, at least attempted to speak truth to power. I was out of joint with the times. Rosa Luxemburg, the 19th century Polish Jewish intellectual who certainly spoke truth to power, and who was knifed, dumped into the canal, insisted that no society was free until those who thought, unlike the majority, were free to say so. With Alexander Cruz's student, I had earned the right to be thus free. I was pretty high even as I enjoyed the right to insist that that was so. Be prepared then to hate Spivak. Upon this note, I went to sleep. I started writing yesterday because I had no time. I went to sleep. As I explained, this lovely invitation came too late for reasons that, I mean, they had, all, they had thought I was too sick. I'm sure you would have invited me earlier if you hadn't thought I was too sick. So the invitation came to me late. I had to field many a sahai. I had to field many assignments before I could confront this possibility of encountering you in anything but my imagination. I couldn't get to work. It has been simmering all this time. And because Colombia is now going easy on the humanities, and I hope to be able to talk about why this book fair is so important because of the tough time for the humanities all over the world, I haven't had any office help now for well over a year. So I do all my office work and of course my housework by myself. Just this trip I was in Morocco dreaming with my wonderful colleague Mama Dujouf about an institute in Africa which with sustained language-based training will teach faculty and students to imagine North, West, East, Center, and Southern Africa. North Africa doesn't think of itself as African. It thinks of itself as Mediterranean. North, West, East, Center, and Southern Africa together through international participation and pulling the Mediterranean into Ifriqiya, Negritude, the contemporary Bantu, and Khoisan. 
and I had gone to fundraise for this. That's how this trip began just a couple of weeks ago. So I really needed to write a speech. I'm not good at fundraising. Hard work. Then I was in Senegal inaugurating their extraordinary 14th Biennale where they too are thinking of how to think heritage. To them, I remarked, among other things, on the NARA document, which perhaps many of you know about, the NARA document on authenticity, 1994, with UNESCO and so on, drawn up under the auspices of the International Council on Monuments and Sites, or ECOMOS. Don't be bored. I'm trying to be as interesting as possible, okay? The um, monuments and sites or ECOMOS. That's when all this heritage talk began, 1994. I was there in the room with a view of the North Atlantic. You want to put the first uh, picture on, Balant, first picture. I was there on the, uh, in, the, uh, in the room with a view of the North Atlantic. Where is it? Where's the picture? I can't see it. Okay. This is not the one I wanted, this is the bloody design. I wanted the one that was on the thing, which was like only the sea, not all these trees. Well, I suppose I'll have to do with this one. So, uh, uh, but I was thinking deeply of enslavement. You, you have to pay attention to me. You look like you're completely bored. Uh, do you have to be here? You know, I'm just wondering. The, um, I was thinking deeply of enslavement because North Atlantic is, was the passageway for the Middle Passage. Because I could see Korea Island from my window, one of the miserable places from where a lot of the contemporary conjuncture of enslavement exited. And as I woke up here in Abu Dhabi around 4.30, because my paper was not finished, I realized that the Spivak who loved to be hated belonged to the time that was well over, more than 40 years ago. Now, as I looked outside my window and all the lights were off and I could see the sandy soil and the sand-colored architecture, no lights in any windows, and only the dawn twilight, I could see the wind shaking the thick cable outside of the window of the tremendous tower-like structure in which I slept, but could not see from outside, I realized that now I thought this is all one world, that it's the same swing in the same sky and the same wind all over, that I now try very hard, counterintuitively, to win as many people as I can to do this thinking rather than inhabit an individuated and nationized opposition analogy. We are different from the West. No, the so-called West, where is it? Is also our heritage, except deeply marked by us. And that is the new task for me, to show how we have marked the so-called West, rather than take this clearly bad faith oppositional stance. As I drank in the beauty of that sandy landscape, that will soon be lit up, I thought. Therefore, of this wind being throttled in the Amazon. I was thinking as, my, as the wind was swinging um, the cable outside my window of the whole world, of the wind being throttled in the Amazon by winning the consent of the locals through the ignoring of another new task inviting the world's subalterns to share the cartographic globe. Let me explain this little part of a sentence, and then I will go back to what I had planned to write this morning, last night. There is a difference. Here is the explanation. Here is the explanation of my minor epiphany this morning looking at the incredible sandy landscape out of my window, which reminded me of a time 
just after the joy in being hated had passed, my time in Madame Ben Maluka's 10th floor apartment in Wuhan in the 80s, looking out at that other sandy landscape that was mountain and the Muezzin sounded all the time. There was a difference. This was flat and silent. Uh, I, the, the looking out that, that, that other sandy landscape in Algeria as I was working with the socialist women going toward the Sahel, asking the women in Benbella's socialist villages, what is it to vote in broken Maghrebi Arabic, which I had learned from diasporic Moroccans at Princeton and the Peace Corps textbook. I had not yet learned to think under the current imperatives that always come from the outside, that we were one world, oceanic thinking. In 2003, I published a book called Other Asias, where I argued that there was no place called Asia. The continentalist fantasy comes from Europe, which is not a continent. It's just the edge of the huge Eurasian island. There was no place called, quote, Asia, yet we must learn to work in its name, to imagine a certain sort of unity, which of course has not been possible. And then I learned to think of the world as ocean. I began to think then that the idea of nations older than nationalisms, something like born same, men harnessing reproductive heteronormativity to push away the bigger heterogeneity of the islands. This was ever in a double bind with our islandedness. History nestles in that denial of the impossible truth of space. If we develop island consciousness, know that the globe is a cluster of islands in a sea of traces and approach the heterogeneity of the ocean world with patience, collectively, and bit by bit, rather than all at once. It may be the only way to find out why that field, that cluster floating in the world ocean is so uneven a relief map. There's no equality, no unity, but we have to think of it that way rather than nationized and always saying the West did it to us. We are so powerless, we were corrupt before. This struggle has to be collective because of the world's wealth of languages. We cannot remain just with our mother tongues and European languages. That is not the future. But I was about to explain my phrase, inviting the world's subalterns to share the cartographic globe. Who is the subaltern? It is the largest sectors of the electorate of so-called democratic countries ruled by tyrants. Asked to vote, but kept away from the rights of citizens or denied citizenship and moved to voting through violence. I know this through my activism, not by reading books. They are the ones who suffer most the consequences of our greed, which is called the Anthropocene, but they have no sense of the cartographic globe, what a world's map really means because of the general class apartheid in education. And therefore, this sentence that the world is one has come to me as a result of my own involvement with subalterns in my own space, the border of the state of West Bengal in India. By the way, uh, Berlant just showed me that the Wikipedia has a nonsense thing about me, that I'm an Indian American. I'm not. I have only an Indian passport and a 60-year-old green card. So someone should correct Wikipedia. No, I'm Indian. Not because I love India, but because I vote there. But anyway, so uh, the, with my involvement with subalterns in my own space, the border of the state of West Bengal in India, where I have been learning how to teach people my own class and caste have harmed for thousands of years, 
giving my time and skill. Second one. Okay, now, this is a mugshot. Of, it, I needed this mugshot for a reason which I can't explain because then my talk would be too long. But these are some of my teachers and co-workers, okay? These are all from the villages. Two of them are illiterate but very smart and I put them there because they've taught me things and I'm not going to go over who they are right now because that would also take too long. But let this picture remain for a little while. These people have taught me the effort that has to be made to make them think that the cartographic world, not just some idea of a world, which certainly exists in their language that I can build on, but the contemporary so-called free education is so poor because nobody cares about the quality of education. They will give money, they will give buildings, they will give computers and so on and so forth. And they will say well, 62 million people are being educated. In what? Uh, they, the uh, contemporary free education is so poor that when two or three years ago I asked my teachers, they're all from the communities, if the earth was bigger or the sun was bigger, all but one said the earth was bigger than the sun. They trusted their eyes because nobody had bothered to explain the words earth and sun. They just see them in the books and they look at the sky. So what would you think? They have never seen the ocean. I want to give you two concrete examples here before I can move on to what I had planned to say to you last night. The first is, My teacher, Kakoli Mondol. The Kakoli Mondol is the one in the second row. She's right on the, or beside the guy, right? With the dot in her, on her forehead, that's Kakoli Mondol. She's the only one who's not a widow. My teacher, Kakoli Mondol, who is so good in mathematics that she could do the square root of two to 63 places with only pencil and paper. No me mechanical help at all. That's good in math. But she has never been on a train. So therefore, this is real poverty because in order to be on a train, you would have to go 45 kilometers. And how would she go? She's been on buses. Uh, the second example is I, something I tried with them recently. As I travel, I make them see where I am and make them promise to show the children where I am when they are teaching, because of course the schools are for children. These are the teachers, I train them, and I see how they're doing with the children. And it gives reality to time change when they know that I'm moving from here to there. Since I talk to them often, almost every day, let me share with you what I said to Exeter University in the UK day before yesterday morning as they Zoom interviewed me on my work. This is what I said. Because they had asked me, well, how are you involved in India? And I said, in general in India, just in the usual way, signing petitions, going on demonstrations, and so on. But my real work is focused, it's teaching and training for the development of a pedagogy that will bring on the intuitions of democracy in the children of the largest sector of the elect electorate, the outcasts and the tribals. I have these four elementary schools for the last 36 years. I work with girls and boys. I also work with ecological agriculture. That's another story. With girls and boys, women and men, from a gender-sensitive practice. I have been asked recently to work with the Ministry of Education. But there, I am feeling my ropes. I like to work with the state when I'm asked. But... Um, I don't really know how to work with the state. As I'm learning the ropes on how to work with the state, I'm consulting my co-workers to help me with the primary textbooks. And I want to cite something Ujjal Lohar said to me. Ujjal is the one right beside Kakoli in the middle. Ujjal Lohar said to me about, about four of these two-hour meetings ago. So we've had about four, about five two-hour meetings now discussing the textbooks. And uh, uh, on the fourth one, she says, Sister, as I'm trying to talk to them as to how I'll advise the Ministry of Education uh, to uh, change the textbooks, 
So she, he says to me, sister, remember, not all the primary school districts in West Bengal have been trained by you because I'm using my principles like I am with you folks. And it is boring for people who haven't been working in this way. It's, when I talk about it, it's not all that interesting, I can see. But um, he actually told me this, you know, don't do it like that. They haven't all been trained by you. Very smart. At any rate, and he's only been to seven years of schooling. He'd been working with me for 17 years, but nonetheless, at any rate, not only do I direct them to the places in conversation as much as I can as I'm traveling, but recently I have taken to consulting Moinak Bishash, a filmmaker and professor of film studies at Jadapur University, one of the elite institutions in India to producing subtitles in elite Bengali, because that's all these um, you know, gentlemen know. I mean, they're generally in Indian English most of the time, and otherwise very elite Bengali. Uh, in elite Bengali, you know, like the, um, which my subaltern co-workers correct as I show videos of evidence that generally are not at all ever accessible to them, evidence of how the world is being destroyed. So therefore, they look at the subtitles, they look at the phot photos, which otherwise they, no one shows them, and yet they suffer the most, but they correct the subtitles because the subtitles are written, and of course these are my teachers, so they read well. They correct the subtitles from elite to common Bengali. The most, uh, I will certainly say that in the, um, uh, we are now f thinking three faculty co-conspirators at Columbia, you know, you know them, Hossein, of introducing some sort of course that would involve film studies, the school of the arts. So these folks are teaching me also how to teach at the top because I do teach at Columbia after all. These, so we are now thinking three faculty co-conspirators at Columbia of introducing some sort of course that would involve film studies, the School of the Arts, and the languages of subalternity, learning the world's subaltern languages in order to produce good subtitles accessible to the lower reaches of language users, unlike the elite translations of, let us say, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, completely inaccessible to the subalterns. The so-called Dari Constitution of, Af of Afghanistan looks like it was translated from English. When you look at the, although they always say it is in Dari, uh, the, uh, the, when you look at it, you, the, and there are many, many expressions that really are English expressions translated. So anyway, those elite translations are useless. The subalterns creolize the imperial language in general use. For example, for harassment, the elite Bengali translation has the word nirjatan. But the subalterns don't even know what that word means when they are talking about harassment. The harassment creolized uh, from, from harassment in English, right? They don't know what the, how the word is spelled or anything, but that's the word. The, the harassment kuchhe, the harassment kuchhe. They never use the Bengali words because they're not accessible to the subalterns. Two more examples before I can go to what I had planned to say to you last night. First, Durban. When I heard the news of the incredible rains there, I called my recently semi-desubalternized co-workers. I will call them subaltern, but by now, if I really explained how they are, they uh, they are not fully subaltern anymore. They, I called my recently semi-desubalternized co-workers <clears throat> and gave them the news so that they could see that all water was one, all land was one. The epiphany of this morning looking at the unlit landscape here. And of course, I asked them to look up exactly where Durban was these people who have never seen the sea. I will certainly not take them on a tour to see the sea. I'm not into sightseeing, but I'm rather into feeling space. The most fortunate among them, sometimes taken to Calcutta for party politics, have seen the zoo. 
Durban and the Indian Ocean are important to them because sister goes there and talks to them from there and makes the map real. And I could tell many stories where they claim that I belong to them. The most fortunate among them, therefore, they have seen the zoo, but I'm not interested in showing them the sea. Then I wrote to my co-workers in Durban, asking them how they were. How did they become my co-workers? They had long ago invited me because of the hate Spivak type reputation. She would pack a punch. So I went. It was a conference on syllabus. They were surprised that I took the time to study very carefully the model that had been given to them by the state to follow in order to access the disenfranchised young folks in the streets of South Africa and pointed at the problems. I pointed at the problems with the model, which was a knowledge management model borrowed from Harvard, intended to teach young people how to create entrepreneurial businesses for themselves, completely unsuitable for the need in Durban and KwaZulu-Natal. As a result, I was asked year after year, because they themselves had felt that there was something wrong with the model, but of course they didn't have the background that I had, so they didn't know why it wasn't working. I was asked year after year to take part in curricular thinking in that part of South Africa, and therefore learned a great deal myself. So I called these friends and asked them how they were, and they said, they were all right, they were all right, but the poor had been completely devastated and had nothing and would not be able, because of the way the state policy was working, would not be able to rebuild their lives. I called my co-workers, these people, once again, because they understand economic difference. And so once again, the, f the fact that the whole world was suffering in the same way because people were not Greed was not allowing us to listen to the warnings of what would happen because Durban had been warned three years ago, as you know, and now it had happened. They had not listened. And so I said this to my co-workers so that my co-workers could get a sense that the whole world was suffering together. These people who have not traveled at all. So now, the example that I have been wanting to get to before I get to what I had planned to say to you last night, here it is, an inadequate description of how I undertook recently. You must realize that this is a part of a very long drawn out process that started long ago. Here is the session that took place on the 26th February. We were talking about other stuff as usual on the cell phone, but it turned out that they were all sitting on the ground on the ground, two outside a village, one in another village, and the student in yet another. I was in New York, of course. I began to talk about the fact that they were sitting on this great globe, that it was actually round, but it was so huge that they couldn't see that it was round. This is part of a conversation that I've been having with them for a long time, long time. That, that this globe was hanging in space and that I was on the other side. I was, I mean, you know, uh, New York is almost exactly on the other side from this place. And m I was hanging with my head down from their point of view and I wasn't falling off. It's a great globe hanging in outer space that they're sitting on. And I asked, why am I not falling off? And the student person, she started screaming, Mathakarshan, Mathakarshan, which is the Bengali word for gravity. And you see the way in which this actually teaches them that sister is sitting with her head hanging in outer space because she's on the other side and we are actually sitting on a great globe which is so big we can't tell it's round. This teaching is quite different from just making them read from books and then repeat the answers uh, to the questions by rote. So, the, and I said to them, look, we are turning so slowly that you don't feel it. But in the book it says, the, the earth turns like a top. So this whole business of an earth turning like a top, etc., they don't connect it with where they sit every day. They, and these are farmers. So they didn't feel the, that they were the center and the poles and the tropics could be measured from each of them. 
I actually said each of your backsides, each of them, and went on and on and on. And I said that they didn't feel the turning, but they could measure it with a stick if the sun was shining. Because by the time we finished, they would see that the sun had moved, and that's how far it had turned, and they had turned with it, but they didn't feel it. I was able to speak to them, of course, in their own local language, which is a version of my mother tongue, even using the colloquial word for backside. The globe was under their backside. Much will have to be done to consolidate this imagining, to map it for today's world work, and then to imagine the time before the map imposed on commons. Commons is maybe not hard for them to think. I cannot just claim it. But with no signage, even for villages, these are people who do not travel. And this will have to happen top and bottom, local by local, for global, through the heart's language, an immense collective job. So when I say that in these, it is these people in my attempts always resulting in failure because intellectual labor cannot be taught and I'm not teaching income enhancement or poverty alleviation. I'm trying to form, as I said, a pedagogy that will insert the intuitions of democracy, that it is other people, that democracy is not just me, 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 that it is other people into the children of the very poor, of the largest sector of the electorate because they vote. And of course, learning from shared failures, shared with these people who work with me. Extraordinary experience, extraordinary joy in living with them. Let me share, if I can, a picture of my room there, firm plank bed. Alas, my computer skills are not good enough to have located it. If it were not nighttime in New York, my indefatigable friend, Surya Parekh, would have located it. I did locate, however, looking for it, a picture of myself studying hard in Du Bois' study in Accra, W.E.B. Du Bois' study in Accra, Ghana. Next picture. Okay. This is a candid picture. I didn't know I was being photographed. Just to give you a sense, it, it was taken by my local research assistant, Bempa, who was just fantastic. The, um, just to give you a sense of my one world, because this greatest historian sociologist of the last century has also taught me to think that way, not just my subaltern school children, but also Du Bois. So therefore, the picture was well found. It, this is his study. And if I had the time, I would show you how his books are completely torn, mouse droppings, nothing. I can't get the money to somehow preserve and conserve this collection from this extraordinary man. Now I think, um, so Moinak Bishash from Calcutta, who is up and free because of the time difference, Surya was asleep, he helped me paste it onto the PPT. Now I think I will go back to what I had thought to say to you last night. This is the last part and you'll see it's different. I hope you will notice the difference between these three sections. The first one where I began with the funny story about hate spivak and then the middle one which was disorganized and I was going from memory to memory of how my, how my, uh, my subaltern co-workers have helped me to think one world. Uh, Berlant, you wanna take this picture away? I don't want people, okay, take, take all the pictures away. Um, so, uh, so I hope you will see the difference between the three sections because unless we notice the change in ourselves, which is what this paper was about, brought up, brought up by this morning's view, unless we notice the change in ourselves brought in by our work for others, we are not useful to the people of different sorts who inevitably cross our path. Here then, last night, before I went to sleep, as I imagined this space, the book fair, and you folks, people to whom I would speak. I plan to say, here at the book fair, there is no room for hatred. Because remember, I was gonna end with hate Spivak, right? There is no room for hatred. For here, the literary is cherished, protected, advanced, and placed securely 
within a powerfully reinvented past here. For remaining thus on track of a past, culture and heritage, and relating it to the contemporary through the book fair, so the past is culture and heritage, and the contemporary is the book fair, I wanted to travel to a theme that I have invoked since the 90s, most recently in Dakar, where the subtitle of the Biennale was art, con Contemporary African Art. Let me share something that I learned, I told them, from the Walpiri of Western Australia. They were no longer working with the traditional means of communication. Although their actual language was in existence and use, they described this as having lost their language. From discussions, what I understood was that that way of working, which was the culture at work, you know, I once asked Jameli Hussain, Hassan, when she did this wonderful, wonderful um, exhibition on uh, Salman Rushdie's fatwa. I asked her, when you are, she is a great artist who lives in Canada. She is Canadian Lebanese. Uh, we walked together and I asked Jameli, Jameli, when you confront the ethical, do you turn to Islam? And she said, nobody had asked me this question ever. I'll think, I'll tell you tomorrow. And the next day she said, no. So therefore, they had, she had lost contact with her own old culture. And so the Walpiri in West Australia would call it losing their language. They were not working with it anymore. From discussions, they understood was that the way of working, which was the culture at work, was no longer their hardware in the computers of their heads, as it were. Therefore, they felt that they had, they had lost their language. And out of that conversation and their demands from the state, I realized what they were asking for was, since their heritage was no longer their performative, to move it to performance. Exhibitions, musical productions, school curricula, theater. Of course, they lived in a settler colony and had a minority percentage of the population quite unlike your situation. But their move from performative hardware in the head computer to performance, accepting that the perf performativity of the tradition was lapsed, has a much broader scope. And as I see folks changing here, the first time I came to this broader area, not, not uh, the Emirates, was in 1980 when I taught at the Women's University in Riyadh. So to an, and to an extent, I um, have seen the change a great deal in detail. So therefore, I would say that the performative uh, change, uh, changes, you no longer work fully with that hardware. So therefore, it must change to performance, shows, musical productions, exhibitions, theater, school curricula. Oil prices go up because of the political economy of the war in Ukraine and the children in the poorest homes stop studying at night because they don't have electricity. So therefore, this is global. The market is our performative. And when market forces are used for social good, as it can be argued at this book fair, we are blessed. Yet, the task of the humanities is to keep an eye on the exceptions and exclusions so, I had thought last night, I would say, we must keep our eye on war, work, and worlding. In war-torn spaces, there are no resources for joyful connections between the reinvented past and an activist contemporary such as at the fair. And I had wanted to mourn the great museums of millennial antiquity in Baghdad and Damascus and wanted to show this picture. Hey, Berlant, where you going? Where you go? Berlant, I need the next picture. Where is she? <clears throat> ah, there she is. Next picture. 
the Syrian war. When the war ends, I'll finish my poem, says Mahmoud Darvish's poem. It's a line from Mahmoud Darvish. The writer is citing a poem from the past to signify a time for future action, heritage at work in war. As for keeping an eye on work, Surya and I looked at a digest of the new labor laws here as carefully as we could under the circumstances he in New York and I on planes with times changing from West Africa to the Gulf. And we felt that the labor laws, the new labor laws were a fantastically good start. And now for you, as you become the allies of the world's subalterns, that new task for changing laws does not change minds in the world's wealth of languages. I repeat my favorite formula, it is just that there be law, but law is not justice. Enforcement alone breeds loopholes. The task is to rearrange existing desires, a version of marketing. Art and musical investment are so threatened as is the literary in the world today. So I end with a picture of me locomoting in the schools. Next, uh, next one. No, this is the Rohingyas. You see, I, I took the Rohingyas away because it, they were not in the, they were in the part I, so no, this is not, not it either. This is, uh, I was going to talk about why I came to America because people ask, people, uh, we'll take the picture a little later, okay? Because this will amuse people, they won't listen to me. Um, people ask, why, did, if you came to America, why didn't, didn't you take citizenship? Well, it was because I didn't come to America to come to America. I came to America because I was supporting myself. I had no money. I've supported myself since I was 17. And because as editor of a journal, I had been extremely critical of the university just in two or three sentences. I was told by my uh, well-wishing professor, Tarak Nath Shen, that I would probably not get first class in my MA. And at that time, because of the five-year plans, a person who did not have the money to pay for her ticket, which I clearly didn't. I mean, you know, my father was dead and I was supporting myself. They would not even get a passport if they were in the humanities because the emphasis was on industry, shipbuilding, and so on. I'm talking about 1960. So I had in my thing, I had in my, uh, on my PowerPoint, the lines from the, in 1960 I was editor. I was 18 years old, but I was very bold. I had really criticized the university and I had the lines from the Presidency College Journal. You want to put that up, the Bengali? And I was going to say something about languages. But at any rate, so um, this, was, this, is, this was the editorial. And then you can go to myself locomoting. I end with a picture of me locomoting in the schools. Since my neuropathy, that is to say the nerve disease, became severe, I bought online a 73-inch belt for an obese man. Surya had many holes securely punched in it, and this is now used to bind me to the driver. Because you see, I have neuropathy in my lower body. Legs are no longer securely connected to the top of my body. So I could fall off more easily. So I have this belt which binds me to the driver. This is, this is a little while ago. A good fast ride is had by Spivak, and uh, that's how everything is taken care of. And then finally, finally, a Columbia class. Last picture. I love them, my grand US students. I've taught full time at a university in the United States for 56 years. I certainly do not connect my students with the state. They're fantastic, and they have also changed. They have been affected in many different ways. So I feel that I do vote in the United States as well, because obviously what I teach is electoral education. I love them, my grandeur students, 
children of and in the superpower, wanting from learning correct theory to simply finding identity to helping the rest of the world. All I can try to teach them is how to read. The perennial task, they are no longer taught how to read. They are taught how to, uh, how to uh, track historical records, how to make the text mean exactly what they thought in a topic sentence and so on. And they, they make historical connections they cannot read. The, um, so all I can teach them is how to read the perennial task of the paid humanities teacher and learn of the predicament of my university from the changing pattern of their skills. I have never won a teaching prize, but I am a happy old woman, even if you hate Spivak, because she spoke so long. Thank you. <laughs>